quarter, you never know what you're going to get yourself into. And the blizzard of 2013, Jackie, you and your reporter, J your photographer, J.P. Coleman, were out on I-91. What happened? Well, we were trying to get back to the station after doing our live shots. And we knew it was pretty bad, but where we were, we couldn't see the highway. So we didn't really know how bad it was out there. Um, within two minutes of being on the highway, I just had that feeling that this was not going to go well. Um, and we saw three cars that were already stuck. We were basically going a half a mile to get off of the highway to then turn around and come back and go south because um, we were at a rest stop. And you were covering the blizzard, of course, is right. what we do for right. a living for the, for the rest of the state. And, and you do hear a lot of people say, oh, you shouldn't have been out there, but we need people out there. It's what we do. Right. So, um, and it's funny, when, when you talk to some of uh, the officials out there, they understand that for the sure. most part, you know. Um, and we were, it was 8 o'clock. It wasn't midnight. It wasn't 1 o'clock in the morning. We were just trying to get back to safety, you know, to do everything else that we needed to do in studio that night. So you're driving, and do you start to avoid a car because there are whiteout conditions? Well, I didn't, you know, I was nervous, as most passengers are. You're a mother of are, six, right. we should say. <laughs> so a very nervous um, passenger at that point. And JP's like, got it, I got it, relax, relax. But you couldn't see a car two feet in front of you. It was just whiteout conditions. So the two of us, are, our eyes are peeled, and we're looking all over the road trying to spot other vehicles that had you know spun out and were stuck and there there were many of them so i said oh there's lights up here um where 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 and then he saw them and he went to go around the car you you couldn't see anything i mean i've it, been in those conditions are terrible it's it's white out yeah and you didn't know what the road where the road was even though there were tracks you didn't know if those tracks were on the road or off the road so what happens so we went around this car and then he went to get you know back into what seemed to be the road and then at that point i saw like the mile marker to my right and i said you're off the road and he said what and i said you're off the road and he's like no i'm not and then we realized we were going down an embankment what town were you in um it was just south of exit 20 which is like the middletown area where the state police barracks is where the armory is in middletown so do you spin and what angle you so you get stuck what happens we're we're sliding down a hill and your first thought is what's at the bottom of the hill am i going to hit a tree is there water? That was my thought. Is there water, you know, at the, at the bottom? Am I going to have to climb out of a window? How, what's going to happen? And then we, he was able to stop the car. He tried to get it out, at which point I just said, it's, this is not going to work. He jumped out of the car, which made me nervous, because now, you know, there are still cars driving by. How close to the highway are you? Well, we were fortunate in that we went down an embankment. All the other cars are stuck on the highway or just on the side of the highway. We were about 15 to 20 feet from the highway. That's how far we slid. And I say it was fortunate because my biggest concern for about the first hour was that one of those 18 wheelers that was still out there, one of those other cars that was out there was going to slide down and hit us. And then I realized that the northbound lanes were up an embankment. So, but it's hard to get your bearings. Yeah, you, you couldn't see. You couldn't see two feet from the car. So what do you, do you call 911? What, what happens then? Um, we called the station first, and then they said call 911. They also called 911. But I had already reserved myself to the fact that we were going to be there all night. Because conditions were so bad, and they couldn't get to a yeah. bunch of folks who were on the highway. Absolutely. Um, you know, when you talk to the, the troopers or, you know, the dispatcher, it was, well, we're going to try, but there's so many others. Yeah. And we knew that because we had passed them. So how many hours and what happens over the course of 10 and a half hours in that car? Well, at first, like I said, it was, what can we do? Can we try and get out? Um, shortly afterwards, a, a plow, but an independent plow, so just a pickup truck. You know, they see News 8 on the side of the car, and they stop, and they want to help us. And I said, it's not going to work. There's, there's nothing. I mean, we're too far down that embankment. It, it's not going to work. But they tried, and then that plow driver ended up getting stuck behind us. Now, do we give a shout out to him? Do we know yeah, his name? Yeah, Cosmo, he, Cosmo is his he tried name. to help you? Um, kudos to him because what we did is um, JP got his phone number and JP went and checked on him at one point and then they kept in contact over the phone to make sure, do you have enough gas? Do you, and that's what you did when you were in the car for 10 and a half hours. But, so you, you had to keep clearing snow and keep clearing the tailpipe. 
correct? Yes. Um, what, once the snow really started coming down, I mean, it was 8.30 at night when we first stopped. And it got really bad, I would say, to me, right around like 11 to maybe 1.30. And then it seemed to quiet down a little bit. But as that snow was coming down, I thought, well, I'm on an embankment. Now it's drifting. I need to keep opening my door. So I would open the door. I would take a scraper and like scrape alongside so that I could get out. So when they could time find to get you. When they, well, that's the yeah. other thing. You know, you're concerned about that drifting and, and what's you know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So JP got out of the car. It was almost too deep. I'm only five foot one, so it was almost too deep for me to to walk. So I was basically stuck in that passenger seat for ten and a half hours. Um, he got out. He shoveled around the exhaust, and we would keep the car running for about forty five minutes, and then we would shut it off. I had my giant coat, and then I had another coat over my legs. Um, we had snacks, we had some water, but we were stuck in the so car for 10 and a half hours. We didn't right. drink, we didn't eat, you know? Right, right, <laughs> because you were conserving. You're, it's funny what you start to do yeah. then thinking. So when does help come and what happens? Well, what happened was, um, you know, plows would come by every now and then. We would still see cars or trucks. I stopped being nervous about somebody sliding off the road because the traffic was just so low um, as far as the number of cars that were going by at that point. There was a hill, so if a car went by, I was pretty sure it was going to get stuck pretty close. Um, the trucks could still make it up, but at one point, a trooper drove by. They, you know, tell us to roll down the window, and they were just doing welfare checks. That's how, you know, that's how many cars were out there. Do you have gas? Do you have heat? Is anybody sick? Is anybody hurt? Which is amazing that our state troopers are doing that, because most people don't know that they are also risking their lives. And they're checking they're on your welfare. They couldn't get you out, but they wanted to know that you were going to be OK. Absolutely. And, and they checked every car. They checked Cosmo behind us. Um, and you know we were safe. We were healthy. We told them, you know, keep going, keep going. Um, you know, go see if there's anybody else out there that really needs help. I don't know if you slid into another car. There were people that had injuries out there. And so we saw two troopers throughout the night. Then, I want to say it was around 4 o'clock in the morning, the National Guard showed up, their truck got stuck right up the embankment from us. Which gives you an idea of the magnitude of this storm. Yeah, these are giant like Humvee vehicles and there were three of them and one of them got stuck and then another one got stuck trying to help that one out. They were there for about half an hour. They came over, they talked to us, uh, we said everything's all right, we're fine. We watched them try and dig out. Eventually a big plow came and was able to get them going again. And what the National Guard was doing, and they did a phenomenal job, uh, was to, they would get the emergency calls and they would rate them on priority. Sure. So if somebody was sick, if somebody was hurt. In our case, what happened was around, I want to say it was a little after 7 o'clock in the morning that I had finally just fallen asleep. <laughs> and what I had done was I would set my alarm every hour for an hour later because I didn't want to fall asleep that long. I wanted to be able to roll my window down, open that door, oh, make grueling. sure we could get out. And these are, you know, the things that you just think yeah. about. Um, JP was able to nap a little bit difference between men and women, maybe, but um, <laughs> he, you know, me, I was, I was just nervous. So I let him sleep. I kept rolling the window down. I would turn the car on, shut the car off. And when they showed up, it was them knocking on the window that woke me up. And Did this bring tears? What, what? You know, it was just, oh, we're here, we're okay. I didn't know that they were really going to rescue us. It was more of a, is it another welfare check? And she said, do you want to be rescued? And I said, well, of course we want to be rescued. And what they had was they had the military ambulance. And we're looking at some pictures. We should look at the rescue here now. Um, yeah, okay. So that actually is a picture. He's carrying a child. That was the whole, there's the car, the ambulance. We were in the back of that. And the whole reason their mission at that point was to get this, this eight-year-old boy, whose, his name was Blair. Um, and they, they got the call that, Blair's car did not have gas or heat. Oh dear. So he was a high priority and that's why they went out. And it was this one, you know, again, in and there's between, little Blair. That's right? Blair, yeah. Okay. So he was happy at that point. We were all happy. These are other people that were stranded as well, all within this, you know, half a mile. So they send the two trucks out to find Blair and then they picked up whoever else was in that area. So all together I think there were sixteen people that went back to they took us back to the armory. And gave you cots and food there? Yeah. What, what um, happened in the armor? They had, well, the other thing was, now we're in these giant military vehicles. We still could not get off the highway. They got on the highway, but none of the ramps were plowed. So it, it was an hour to go back what should have been a half of a mile. 
but we had to go south and then uh, somehow we ended up on the Berlin Turnpike. I mean, if you don't know the area, you don't know what I'm talking about, but it was quite the trek. And when you're back there, you can't see anything. There's a little window and um, so all we can see is white. So here you are again in this, I have no control over this situation. And it's a little, it's nerve wracking, very bouncy, but everybody in that truck was just really happy at that point to be in there. Most, most people were trying to get home from work. You know, so a lot of people say, don't be on the that. road. But, you know, like I said, if you have kids at home and, and you're a parent and maybe you have a 13-year-old at home, you need to try and get home. It's, it's not always as simple as I can't, I, you know, there's no way I can do it. Um, there were some people out there who were just driving to sort of drive. But most people were either, it was job related. Well, you're safe and sound now, and yes. we're glad. And we sing praises to the state police <laughs> and to the National Guard. And there is JP. That's JP. And you in the so, newsroom, safe and sound. Happy to be back, to be warm, to have showered. <laughs> and a reporter's life is a reporter's life. So we became the news. Jackie, thanks for coming on. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs>